you know, most of the people, when they look at the whole UFO subject, it, if you even uh, deconstruct the language, UFO, unidentified flying object, well, in reality, the intelligence community incre- created that name and uh, because they have not been unidentified since the 40s when we retrieved an extraterrestrial vehicle from Roswell, uh, if not earlier. And they do not fly in any aerodynamic sense of the word because they use advanced physics that are not aerodynamically based. The only part of the UFO term that is accurate is, oh, an object. But let's think about that for a minute. Most organizations have UFO in their title. Um, whereas CSETI, the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, has ET in its title. And the reason for that is that we're a person-oriented diplomatic team, not an object-oriented team. And this is something that isn't obvious. And this is something that I rarely speak about, but I think it's time for me to speak about it. And that is that we really need to go from a materialistic, reductionist view of this issue to saying, oh, I saw an object, to thinking about, well, who's inside the object and why are they here? I mean, it's very nice to see a UFO, and it's quite exciting and quite interesting, and we've certainly seen many of them in our expeditions. But what's more interesting is the contemplation of the fact that there are interstellar civilizations visiting Earth at this time in our history, which is a very critical moment in our evolution, and that there are intelligent life forms on board these, quote, UFOs. Now, of course, I've always said that there are two types of UFOs, the ones that are made by Lockheed Martin and Northrop in the aerospace industry, which are called alien reproduction vehicles and that are completely man-made uh, anti-gravity platforms that have been in existence since the 50s. And then there are the ones that are of interstellar origin, which are quite different and quite amazing in how they move and appear and disappear and materialize and dematerialize and what have you. And I think this gets into this whole concept of what are the technological requirements of being interstellar. Uh, And you've really got to take a big step out of the box to get your mind wrapped around this. And this is what I want to do for folks today. It's going to be a little bit mind-blowing, but I think it's time for us to know this. This is what all of our children and grandchildren should know, and this is certainly what we should have all known. Those of us who were born, like myself, in the 50s, by the time we hit grade school, we should have been learning this this knowledge and science had it not been kept secret. And I want to go into this, particularly with this audience at the World Puja Network, because it involves so much the science of consciousness and the ancient Vedic concepts of awareness, except in a space-age way, and that is the interface between uh, consciousness and thought and trans-dimensional technologies and linear space-time and science. And this is really what we're going to talk about because the photograph that you can now all see at cseti.org proves what I'm about to discuss. And there's no question about the provenance or the origin of the photograph because we were all there when it was taken and we know the woman who took it who is absolutely trustworthy. Now, I think that... uh, this this whole question of uh, contact and how it might appear is really a central one because everyone's trying to put the ET reality into 20th and early 21st century human reality. Uh, but the problem with that is that it's too anthropocentric, and only anthropocentric, but uh, Western science-centered where our science that is talked about, at least publicly, uh, as opposed to what exists in the classified projects, uh, is really uh, something out of the dinosaur era. And I think that one of the things that we have to begin to contemplate is how will civilizations that are interstellar and moving through space at many, many times the speed of light, how will they appear? What would it be like? 
And I think this is something that's quite amazing to contemplate. And this is why I wrote uh, my books uh, that many of you have read, Hidden Truths, Forbidden Knowledge, my autobiography, but the most recent book, Contact, Countdown to Transformation, which goes into this in great detail because it's crossing into areas of the Vedic uh, puja knowledge of science of consciousness, but it's also highly scientific, and it's a whole new science that's being developed by the, by the knowledge that we're gaining from studying how extraterrestrial civilizations move across space-time. So I think that one of the things I would like for people to understand is that, uh, you know, if we were to go back, just, let, just think for a minute, and let's visualize going back. I'm sitting here near um, Thomas Jefferson's home here in, in near the University of Virginia in, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and, and think of going to Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, in 1776 and showing up with an iPhone uh, or, for that matter, a flashlight. Well, you would look like something out of a absolutely science fiction or myth or uh, unbelievable. In fact, it would be denied that it would be possible to have something like an iPhone, that you would have videos and could talk to people in other parts of the planet, et cetera, and so on. And that's only 200 and some years ago. Now extrapolate forward several thousand to several million years of technological and conscious evolution. That's what we're dealing with. So you're going to have to really have, a, it's, it's, it's a, for scientists in particular, it's a very big dose of humility to contemplate what the technological capabilities are of those civilizations that have gone this way before us and who are capable of interstellar travel. So with that said, moving beyond the kick the tires of the UFO mindset, and let's start thinking about the people on board and sort of what their reality might be. You know, we turn on a cell phone or, or a light switch as easily as not think anything about it or get into a hop on a jet and go to Europe. But these civilizations have technologies that interface with consciousness, thought, that dematerialize an entire spacecraft with beings on it and reappear in another point in space-time as easily as we get on a 747 and fly to uh, Frankfurt. So I think that we have to begin to think, how might they appear? What does it mean? And, and this is really opening up a door to our future. At the same time, the future is now. Because in reality, the classified projects and the projects that I've been introduced to scientists who are very senior in these projects have figured out all these sciences. And I mean, it's sad for the world that we don't have them. And of course, we're working to fix that problem through the orionproject.org. But in terms of contact with these civilizations that are here and who have been here, I believe, for thousands of years, if not millions of years, as uh, observers of the Earth and perhaps guardians of life on Earth, I think we have to begin to contemplate now that we've reached the point of evolution on our planet where we're united in a global village and going into space, they're here waiting for us to answer their presence, but answer their presence with some meaningful paradigm, operational paradigm, where we really understand how they get here, how they contact us, how they communicate, and how they might manifest around us, um, besides in something that's fully materialized, although that certainly has happened. So this photograph is really a doorway into that reality, which is why it's an amazing teaching moment that the ETs gave us uh, in Joshua Tree. And I'm going to get into the detail of that. But first, I'd like for Linda to sort of describe where we were and what happened that day, because she was sitting right next to Raven Nabolsi when this photograph was taken, but I was also with me uh, in the uh, uh, hour or so before the photograph happened when there were some amazing things that transpired out in the desert. Well, right. Dr. Greer and I and some other people walked out on the path that heads to the east out across the desert from our contact site. And whenever we walk out there, it's always incredible because we always encounter ET beings and crafts out there, and they're always quite visible because they're 
they're lit up. I mean, there's been times in the past, in fact, that the, the beings have been so well lit that you could see their forms very easily. And one particular time we were out there and a jet came over and they dimmed down very perceptibly. And, and, and then when the jet passed, they brightened back up. It was a and, military jet. Yeah. Right, it was. It, was uh, it detected them, actually, and, and that's why it came over. But in any case, so, so we always have marvelous experiences when we go out onto this desert site. And so we walked out there, and we were in an, an etheric ET craft. It was, it was glowing and sparkling all around us. It was very large, for as, about as far as we could see. And there were beings as well. And we walked quite a ways out, maybe up to a quarter of a mile, out on this path, sandy path. And, um, and while we were standing there looking in the distance, yeah, we saw the laser the uh it was like a white laser shoot up at a at a, a bit of an angle and um and dr greer right away said well that that indicates something's about to happen and um i don't really remember how long it was after that but it, it wasn't too long after that we decided to walk back and we were just beginning to turn to go back when suddenly there was this huge massive burst of light. It was a little behind me, but some of the people that were behind me got a full view of it. And I spun around, um, didn't see the very beginning, but the people that did said it went up like a huge fountain of emerald green, way up into the sky. And by the time I turned around, the green, it was sort of like the fountain was spilling into like a, a, a half, giant half moon, only it was huge. It covered, oh, it's, I, I, it's, it's hard to say. Um, it lit up the entire desert. Right. The whole, it lit up the whole desert floor. It covered like his, our, our whole scope of vision when we were looking in that west, in that northerly direction. And then the colors started changing into pink and a gold and, and ultimately magenta. And it was just gorgeous, and it lasted for several seconds. And so we saw this when, as we were walking back um, – uh, up the path towards towards where our chairs were in the circle, and, and actually most of the people were still up there. Um, Dr. Greer pointed out to me that he he saw a, a, a sphere about the size of a silver dollar, a white sphere um, that was ahead of us, but but you know heading in our same direction. And and I actually just barely glimpsed it. When I glimpsed it, it was in the direction of. It was heading towards the direction of the bush that's in the photo of the ET being. And, and then I just glimpsed it very briefly. But then we, we got to, to our group, and we were talking about the brilliant display that we had all just seen in the north. No one missed it because it was just, you know, even if, with your back turned, you saw the glow of light. And, and so we were talking about that. And while we were talking about that, um, I heard, and, and I know most other people heard, like some voices talking from the vicinity of the path we had just um, entered the circle from, and there were no people over there. We had night vision. We checked. We double-checked with night vision because it was pitch dark, as a matter of fact, at this time. It was, um, it was between 11 and 11.30 p.m. California time at this time. Um, I, in fact, I, I clocked, I, I have an audio recorder that I keep with me all the time, and I clocked the time of the big display of, of light at 11.07 p.m. And so then we, we got back to the circle, and we were sitting around talking, standing around actually talking, and we heard these voices, very distinct, several voices. I heard, actually, it sounded like maybe three or four, mostly higher pitch like women's possibly but then there was a, at least one lower one in it where it sounded like a male and, and i should point out that uh, you know i have these uh, fourth generation night scopes and looked in the area there were no humans there right but this was uh, dozens of people heard these beings speaking right but they weren't very materialized audible. you couldn't see anything with the naked eye but it was in the exactly in the area of where this uh, disc or orb uh, had had blipped in and out briefly. It was very strange. Uh, and one other comment: that the field that we had gone out into is the field that we, in 1996, saw this massive ET craft uh, about 200 feet in diameter coming right out of the zenith of the sky. 
and lit up the entire desert. Uh, it looked like a Hershey's Kiss and was sort of teal blue-green and went straight into the desert right out there. And we had been told that the ETs actually had a presence out in this part of Joshua Tree National Park. And in fact, the, the laser that we saw that shot up towards the sky right before the big burst of light was a whitish beam of light that... Uh, from an area where there were no people, no humans at all, that was visible by many of us with the naked eye. Anyone looking in that direction saw it. And it came up from that ground where this craft had right. landed in 96, up towards the sky and in the direction uh, of where both the burst of light was and the subsequent orb uh, that floated along in the desert leading up to the group when we were walking back. Yes, so we had all these things happening, and, and then Dr. Greer said, let's all take our seats again. Well, not everyone moves at the same rate of speed in and, and that situation, and, and Raven and I um, happened to be sitting side by side in the area of the circle that was facing east. And so we took our seats, and I heard Raven clicking away in the dark. It was pitch dark. You could not even see with the naked eye the chairs on the other side of the circle. Um, there were no flashlights over in that area whatsoever. Raven was just sitting there, clicking her camera without a flash, in you know, in, into the darkness. Which you know, we do we do that sometimes because you never know what you're going to pick up. And and then um, we were having a lot of activity around us that night, as we always do at Joshua Tree, and it is the place of the Orion transmissions as well. So so it's a, it's a highly active place. So. That I I don't know. Do you want me to talk well, see, about then, that then night? What's more. interesting about this is that it was a moonless night, November seventeenth, right. two thousand nine. And you can look it up. There's no moon up, uh, and uh, Raven had a a, a, good, a digital camera, which is it was a single lens reflex that she could adjust the uh, aperture and the f stop. So she had it open for three and a half seconds. So she was holding the camera by hand, it wasn't on a tripod, <laughs> and the, the lens was open for three and a half seconds. And during that time, in an instant, this orb materialized and created a cone of light. Now, I want to describe this to you all now, because this is what's really important. Again, there's no moon, nobody has any flashlights on, there's an orb that appears, and in the photograph, when you go to the website, you can look at this. Um, there's an orb that appears just to the left of a bush. And in the cone of light, there's so much light that it illuminates the chairs that have blankets and sleeping bags draped over them. And about eight feet from the, where the orb is, is an ET beam that's hovering in the air, suspended in this cone of light that is a, I estimate, a, uh, around a, f a four to five foot tall being. Uh, outside, just outside our circle, and uh, he's clearly humanoid, but not human. And this is the best photograph I have ever seen of an actual diplomatic contact event where an ET beam has been photographed to, with this level of clarity. And what's important about this, well, there are a number of things. A, remember that this is a CSETI CE5 event, a close encounter of the fifth kind event, where we're setting up the protocols using electromagnetic tones and sensors and lasers and consciousness using remote viewing and connecting with thought and consciousness to the extraterrestrial communication systems and inviting them to come and meet with us in a diplomatic mission as representatives of humanity to these interstellar civilizations. So this is not a chance event. This is a planned event. And this ET, who I'm quite sure is a senior interplanetary ambassador, um, shows up and actually poses for the camera. Now, Raven had asked the ETs if they would help her get these photographs. And there's an aspect to this that's kind of strange because in consciousness and thought, there's a lot of interactivity here. And the reason there is is because interstellar, faster than the speed of light communication systems, interface with directed thought. So just like we have coherent light makes a laser, coherent thought 
can be used within an expanded state of consciousness. This is where it gets very Vedic and very Puja on the World Puja Network, is why I want to talk about it, where it becomes a source a directed energy field in thought that connects to the ET communication systems, and they pick that up as easily as our radar systems would pick up a 747 coming into John F. Kennedy Airport in New York. Now, what's important about that's what we teach during these expeditions, like the one we're going to do in uh, the Outer Banks in, in April. We're going to go out there and do this for a whole week with, with those of you who want to join us. Now, what's interesting about this photograph also is that there was, aside from there being no moonlight and no uh, artificial source of light presence, it's clear enough that obviously this being and the light, the orb, flashed in so quickly it had to be in a fraction of a second. Right. Because if you look at the, those of you who want to go to the website at cseti.org and look at this picture, you'll see that the, uh, the blankets and sleeping bags that are draped on these chairs that are in our circle, or you can see every crease and fold in them. You can actually see the individual leaves on the bush that's to the right of, of this orb. And you can actually see the being uh, hovering above the third chair on the right, uh, to the right side of the, the, this picture frame. Now, what's, what's a fascinating thing is that when you zoom in on it and you see, um, you can see uh, there is a head, uh, a chest, and arms, and two legs. The, 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 the uh, right leg of the ET is, is, behind, is bent 45 degrees behind him. It obviously looks like a male. It's very human looking, except it's not human because you look at the distance between the eyes, which are wearing a type of night vision goggles, and the top of his head is about uh, three times higher than the distance between human eyes and the top of our head. He has an enormous cranium. And on top of his cranium is a disc like white object that is a trans-dimensional energy projection system that enables him to be teleported there trans-dimensionally. I'm going to get into the science behind this in a minute. For those of you who are interested, you uh, may want to listen. Now, he's hovering right above that third chair just outside the circle. Now, in that area, now what's interesting about this is that he's looking straight at the camera. Right. There's no question when you look at this. This is not a hoax, my friends. I mean, the debunkers are going to try to say, this can't be, it can't be, it can't be. Let me tell you, it is. I will bet my life on it. I would stake my everything on it. I was there. Linda was there. We know who took the picture. We were there when it was taken. This is an actual ET visiting us in Joshua Tree National Park. And right. Now, what's interesting about this being is that he, you can see his mouth. He's got a slight smile. You can see his nose is brighter than the rest of his head because it's sticking out and being illumined in the orb. Hit the, 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 the right, the, as you're looking at him, the left side of his face, his right face, is much brighter than the, the other side of his face because it's in the shadow of this sort of trans-dimensional light and orb. And his left arm is, is in the air almost like he's waving at the camera, and his right hand is at his waist. And he has a very distinct forehead with a uh, two ridges on it and indented the centers of, between the two ridges on his forehead have these indented areas, very unusual sort of shape to his forehead, and very much not human. But yet the skin color is like that of a Caucasian. Um, he's a, a clearly a humanoid being, uh, and uh, it, it's just an, it is the single most amazing photograph I've ever seen in my uh, <laughs> since I was a child looking into this subject and studying this subject. Um, he's got boots on both of his feet. You can see, um, you can actually see the heels, um, and uh, you can see the left leg very clearly. Now, what's interesting about this is that, of course, this is uh, a being that's uh, not from this star system, not homo sapien, not human, and yet he's very humanoid. And he's there interacting with the group. And this is the kinds of things that we've seen when we see these really rapid bursts of light and orbs that appear, and then we'll see a scintillating form, the shape of a humanoid. But with the naked eye, you don't really see quite clearly 
the sort of flesh and blood, I hate to use that term, aspect of it. This photograph is like a flesh and blood photograph. And remember, this is an ordinary camera. There's no flash bulb on it. It's not infrared. It's not night scope. It's a regular camera that was set on this the shutter opening long enough that it gave him a chance to come in, zip in, and sort of come into linear space-time, into this three-dimensional reality, and pose and, and wave at the camera and look straight into the lens of the camera. And that is astonishing. That is yeah. absolutely... And this is a wake-up call of what's coming. Because <laughs> it's going to go from this to further and further expressed contact. But they're sort of using our group as an entryway, and this is why we're sharing this to prepare the world for the open contact that's coming between humanity and Earth and these other amazing interstellar civilizations that are uh, around the Earth and in concerned with the evolution of, of life on Earth and uh, humanity's destiny. And so uh, this uh, E.T. who, uh, who came uh, to, to Joshua Tree, while we were asking the E.T.s to gather, and by the way, we saw many of these sort of a brilliant orbs and lights flash in, but in this case, Raven asked the ETs to appear when she would be holding the shutter open. Now it's interesting because the other pictures just show black desert. There's nothing. The because, pictures again, that she took before and after this one. She oh, took yes. a sequence. She took a whole sequence, and the ones before and after, it's just dark. There's nothing there at all because right. no one had flashlights on. No one had anything. Right. And I also want to point out because there's been some confusion about this. Um, since the photograph was released uh, a couple days ago, is that some people say, well, maybe it's some lights hitting a tree or something. There are, where this ET appears, he chose the one spot that's open and clear desert for as far as the eye can see to the horizon. Absolutely. Because as you're looking at where this ET being is, because we went out and measured everything exactly and precisely. We spent two we hours did. doing it. Um, the bush is uh, to the left of the ET uh, about eight feet. So he's eight feet to the right of the bush. There is a Joshua tree about eight and a half feet further to the right off the frame. Right. And between those two things, there's nothing there. It's right. open desert for as far as I can see. There is no chance that this is some sort of a, a artifact anomaly of some kind of light shining on something because right. in that area... From the level of the chairs up, if you're standing from sitting from where Raven took this picture, it's open air for as far as the eye can see across flat desert. Uh, there are no other trees and bushes. And the other thing is that one person said, well, it's the moonlight shining on something. If you go and look at November 17th on the calendar, it was a new moon with no moon. There was no zero moonlight. Uh, there was no, in fact, it was so dark that in the photograph you can actually see Mars in the upper left corner of the frame. Um, and, and you could see Mars with the naked eye, but, but if, you, if you'll notice the orb that's illuminating the chairs and, and the CT, making, making it possible on purpose for this to appear on film or, or on digital camera, I mean, this was done on purpose by the ETs so it would be captured by the digital camera, but you can see that little orb. It's almost as bright as Mars. That's you can right. see it. It showed up in the photo, but it was not visible with the naked eye because I was looking right there when she took the pictures, just like she was. There was pitch darkness over there. Well, it, or but if it was, it was so visible, quick. it may have been so quick yeah, it you was didn't too notice. Quick. Yeah. See, one of the problems is that the, the optic nerve and the, the mind can only see things with a certain time interval and a certain, and this is, of course, how subliminal things are done in, in films, where they put things in in the film. But it's so fast, you don't see it. Yeah. With, you, don't re, you don't note it. Well, we're dealing with technologies here where uh, an extraterrestrial civilization whose technologies are by definition, let's go back to the first part of this, this discussion, is by definition they have to have the capability to vibrate, resonate, have a frequency faster than the speed of light so that their spacecraft and all the people in it shift in a quantum leap beyond the speed of light into, into really other dimensions, if you will, trans-dimensionally, and then reappear in another point in space-time. That's what this is. In this case, the craft was trans-dimensionally shifted out in the field that we had been seeing, and our detectors mm -hmm. 
all of our electromagnetic detectors were going bananas. We're out in the That's middle right. of this 800,000 acre national park. And we had magnetometers that were pinging off the scale, which measuring the magnetic field flux, you know, very anomalous things. We had radar and laser detectors and other detectors and uh, going completely nonlinear off their scale and locking on. We had um, temperature gauges, uh, thermometers. Yes, and we had a temperature change happen where this object came around us, and it went from about 36 degrees to 69 degrees right. out in the open desert with a wind blowing right? Uh, because of the thermal effect of the density of this trans-dimensional craft coming close to us and, and etherically, if you will, uh, occupying the space and, and warming it up. It was very welcome because it was quite a chilly night. But the point is, this is the kind of things that are going on. And what's exciting about this is that it demonstrates a number of things when we start looking at how an ET civilization can appear very enigmatically and quickly. Now, of course, the ET didn't need to appear just when the, when the, when the shutter was open, but we had invited them to come, and Raven had asked them to use her and her camera and the timing of her reflexes of taking the pictures to appear, and they did. And this started at the Outer Banks in 09, a few months ago, in uh, April or early May of 2009. She had the idea to do this, and that's when this ET craft appeared in broad daylight right off, the sh off of our deck. Of the, we rent this big oceanfront house. Uh, at the Outer Banks of North Carolina, out, on, out in the Atlantic Ocean. And this craft appeared. Now, again, she didn't see anything with the naked eye, but clear as a bell, there's a disc right off over the ocean from the deck of the house uh, hovering there. Right. And um, that's when it started. And then, by the way, as I mentioned, you can go to cseti.org and see we're going to take a, a, a training group and a diplomatic mission back to the Outer Banks uh, in April, I forget the date. April 11th through 17th this year. Yeah, uh, April 11th through 17th. And we're going to be uh, at this same site where this ET craft appeared and was photographed uh, last year in 2009. So what's fascinating is the interactivity that happens with both consciousness and technology because, again, this is a digital camera. It's not like it's photographing ghosts. It's photographing something that has to be there, but it was there very quickly in this dimension. And then it went beyond the crossing point of light, the speed of light, and was invisible, but was present because the, the electronic detectors kept going off. Right. They did. Okay. So what I'm saying, what I'm describing here is that what you want to begin to visualize is imagine having the ability to take a solid, say, a person in a spacecraft and it's solid and it's material and it's physical. And then create a set of electronics where you can shift all the matter and the electrons and the, of the, everything in it and shift it at a frequency where it raises, where it goes beyond the frequency and the speed of electrons and matter and phases into another dimension. Now imagine being able to be between dimensions. And this is going to get into some very interesting uh, thought here, where it's sort of like a rheostat, where you turn a, a, the dial uh, on a radio, where you're going an old-fashioned radio, where you're going up and down uh, the AM or FM uh, dial, and there are different hertz, which are frequencies. And at one frequency, you get one radio station. At another one, you get another one. But there could be something where you're in between, and you might hear two or three stations at the same time. What the ETs have the ability to do is to be completely materialized in linear space-time, completely dematerialized, way beyond the speed of light, where there would be no detectability. Uh, in linear space-time, and then they can be between dimensions or begin to bleed into linear space-time or just blip in very quickly, which is what this ET did, obviously, in the photograph, because it's an authentic pro photograph, the provenance of which is not in question at all. Right. We were right there when it was taken, yeah. and it was witnessed, and there's no question about what this is. When you look at this photograph, it is astounding, because... 
it's an ET visiting us, waving and looking right into the camera, greeting us. And uh, this is something amazing to behold. Um, and one of the things that it says to me is, I mean, I've, I founded uh, CSETI uh, 20 years ago this year in 1990. And it says to me that the time for uh, the unveiling of the truth, the end of secrecy, the full known presence, that we're not alone in the universe, that we're part of a cosmic family of civilizations, and that we're at this cosmic moment where we're going to jump into cosmic awareness and a cosmic culture. This is all upon us. And that's what I meant uh, when I first said earlier in this, this, uh, this discussion that the veil is becoming quite thin. And the time is quite short in terms of when these uh, amazing uh, changes are going to happen. And because it's one thing for, a, uh, for an ET spacecraft to show up and be photographed, and we have many of those. If you get the book, Contact, Count Down the Transformation, you'll see many of these that we've uh, had uh, encounters with over the years. And we've had also ETs briefly appear and dematerialize around us, but for one to actually pose for the camera and blip in and out of space time like this this is an order of magnitude this is a new era i don't mean to overstate it but it's a whole new paradigm and uh because again <laughs> we're not just talking about their machinery which everyone gets kind of fixated on because we're so materialistic and we're so into gear and uh, equipment and airplanes and things but this is a person and it's clearly not a human person. And he's clearly there, very close to us, greeting us. And what does that mean? 